Hi, everybody. Welcome to our podcast. Um, we're here with our host, Clarice Abelarda, and our co-host, Molly Champlin. We're here with our featured artist, Mirabel Wigan. She has a solo show currently up right now at Axis Gallery. Is that right? <laughs> okay. Um, Mirabel Wigan is an artist residing in the San Joaquin Valley of California. She creates large-scale landscape paintings grappling with environmental phenomena resulting from and related to the built landscape. These paintings explore notions of progress, instability, and system collapse. Her works have been featured in numerous group exhibitions, both regionally and nationally. Her recent work has been exhibited in cementation slash disillusion at Axis Gallery in Sacramento, California, Fragments at Strata Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. New Voices at the Jackie Head Headley University Art Gallery in Chico, California. Shifting Ground at the Michael Stearns Gallery in San Pedro, California. Made in California at Brea Gallery in Brea, California. And Painted 2021 Fifth Biennial Survey at Manifest Gallery in Cincinnati, Ohio. Her awards include the Linda A. Day Endowed Student Award, Werby Maryland Award, and Provost Purchase Award. She received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Traditional Art from California State University East Bay, and her Master's of Fine Arts in Drawing and Painting from California State University Long Beach. She is currently Assistant Professor of Art at California State University Stanislaus, where she teaches drawing and painting. So welcome our artist, Mirabel Wigan. Thank you so much, Clarice and Molly, for having me here. I'm super excited to talk about this work here in uh, Hollow Vale. So this is also at Axis Gallery. So I'm really excited to chat about this with you both today. So that's Welcome. awesome. Yeah, I'm so I'm happy to have you here and to get to hear about the work. Yeah. Um, should I dive right in like a brief synopsis before yeah, like the Q and A? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I would say the work right now in this exhibition is actually from the past eleven months, and it was, you know, my work is really informed by me and living in a particular place and the spaces that I navigate, right? And I feel like it's really this collection of work that I've developed over this past eleven months um, is basically responding to like all this environmental phenomena. So like when I was in grad school, I was really focused on how the built industrial landscape and extractivism in the area of the Port of Los Angeles was like affecting the surrounding environment and, and basically uh, how energy distribution was affecting the state at large. And so when I moved here, it was like a big shift, right? Like I'm kind of like open plains in the valley. And I, it struck me there was like these really significant environmental impacts that were occurring like first it was like these really big fires that were just happening all around me um and then last winter right uh there's this like really big terrible storm and where I lived there was lots of flooding the levees broke trees were falling down everywhere and I felt like wow I'm like kind of situated in this prime location to see all of this like terrible environmental catastrophes happening due to climate change. Um, and that's, and this work, I kind of see it like, this one is like really responding to um, the storms that happen. And then the prior, the prior show, Sedimentation Dissolution was about the fires occurring. So I'm kind of like, it's a record of events, so to speak, um, of the location that I'm in. And I feel like my work is trying to grapple with like a bunch of things simultaneously and I, I feel like the question I'm trying to ask myself is like what is our what is my relationship to being in a place uh, how do I navigate space and in that way it's kind of an analogous to how I want to um, control right like control or cultivate the space of the canvas um, and maybe allow this kind of chance and accident that happens, this disorder, I'm hoping it provokes like an answer <laughs> in a way, like an answer to um, perhaps that sort of, like I said, a, a lot of analogies here, like I'm trying to make parallels that um, when you let go of that control, that design, 
that cultivating aspect that maybe there's like a a pathway forward to like a positive foreseeable future. So that's in a nutshell, some of the things I've been thinking about um, for this exhibition. Yeah. Um, I, I'm interested in this idea of cultivation. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you have, um, it's the landscape you're in is very agricultural, right? And it's, so it's something you mentioned in your artist statement here. Um, yeah, um, cultivation. Oh my gosh, I've gotten really down the rabbit hole with this idea of cultivation. So, because um, you know, at first I was like, oh, I'm, when I first moved up here, I was making all these like cloud paintings, like above this like agricultural. I mean, it was abstracted, but it was sort of like a quasi aerial views of like, the surrounding agriculture on the Delta, because I'm in the San Joaquin Valley. I live in Lodi. I'm right next to um, these two major rivers that converge into the Bay. Um, Molly, you lived in the Bay Area, so you know, like, you're, you're right there in, like, the middle of these, like, wetlands, right? These two major mm -hmm. rivers, and they spill out into the Bay. Um, so it's, like, really responding to that. But the more I started making this work, I realize like, what are the things that I keep kind of gravitating toward? And I notice like, I sort of live right now in like a sort of rural area. Uh, I live in Lodi, California. So it's sort of, it's sort of rural, it's farmland, but it's also like a suburban, like farm town, you know, you're kind of have both in this place. And there are these like, um, like walkways and natural parks that are along like the river um, and like Lodi Lake, for example. And I was thinking about like, oh, all these environmental disasters are happening and the trees are going down. And, you know, it's a semblance of nature, right? Like we're cultivating this space mm. it has to be foreseen. Everything that happens in there is like highly curated. And I realized like, that's kind of what that was the entry point. Like when I was making this show, the ideas are still forming as I'm making the painting. Like, I'm like okay, I'm responding to this disaster. W why this particular place, why the disasters in this zone are, are like affecting me so heavily. And I realized it's because I'm in there all the time. Uh, and it got me thinking a lot about uh, the parallel between gardening, gardening and cultivation um, and how, you know, it's interesting because that's sort of like how painting, how painting is, right? Like um, it is, gardening is an illusion of the real, like you're trying to recreate the semblance of nature, but it's like a semblance of appearances and painting sort of does the same thing. Uh, but I like to kind of invert that idea, like, oh, what painting is not just an illusionary space, it can be a space of feeling, you know, and gesture. And how can I like bring that back into the work too? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I hope that like kind of you know, answers. Yeah. It seems like with both, there's um, like cultivating gardening painting. There's mm -hmm. um, you are working directly with the nat like natural forces that are out of your control, like plants. There's maybe a little bit of a science you can study how to garden but then you know crazy stuff happens um and a painting i think can be very similar um mm -hmm. so are you finding um like what's that energy that's the plant energy from the that's that's um i guess you're in collaboration with in the painting yeah no i love that um i've been thinking like I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about like these, like, uh, like, how do we embrace that sort of energy, right? Like, there's like, I mean, I have it myself, like, I can get really anal retentive in the painting, like, I want to figure out, it's mostly like a design game, I feel like I get entrapped in that, right? And I wonder, like, oh, well, when you're gardening, or you're trying to mimic something, like, in nature, or you're trying to harness a plant, or whatever, you're trying to, like, put it in a box and figure it out, but I think the great thing about like the art of gardening is that there is the, like that regrowth, that potential for something new that was unexpected, 
like I don't know. I I have a garden that now I have to tend. I'm I'm a renter, but like it's a pretty like, I mean it's an elaborate garden for me. So there's a lot of trying to make it like nice, and then I realize well I kind of like the idea that if it breaks free, something unexpected happens. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, that sort of energy I can bring into the work. Like maybe I can just accept when something like spontaneous or it, like a collision happens maybe I can let it be and maybe that collision could like birth and affect something more positive something new mm -hmm. or mysterious I mean I'm getting really into sensation and feeling a lot like I think being able to experience a painting in that way is like super important um I don't know I, I think like for myself like I want to feel like encapsulated and have like an emotional response or I hope someone has an emotional response. Yeah. yeah. I'm um, wondering the forms um, that are kind of growing or developing in your painting, are they very spontaneous or are they a combination of like physical plant references? <laughs> um, is there like a, a genealogy of these plants that you're kind of following? Uh, I see what you're saying. So I don't know. For, it's like a morphing that's happening, I think, because of the painting process rather than replicating like a growth pattern per se, because I'm also, it's in a way documenting an event occurring. Like so Zenith, all, you can probably see it's all the way far in the back. Um, it, the red that's like showing through is like there is an event occurring and then all like spontaneous regrowth like collapsing like a time frame in there yeah. and I think that's something I sort of do in all of the work at this point right now so it's really like this documentation of an event the before and after colliding um but in terms of like how I document the natural world around me I've been into this idea of like making really bad models. <laughs> I think I've always been into making really bad models, especially in grad school. Like they were pretty bad. Molly, I, I don't know if Clarice, you remember seeing them, but they were not like exact or pristine in any way. And like I'm channeling that into I I love this photo photogrammetry stuff. It's like really oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh I'm yeah. Not, perfect and this is what's great about it because I'm not perfect I get like these really messed up uh, models that don't make a lot of sense um and I and I think that's interesting like that I, I maybe there's something to those like motifs of like disruption that seem really prevalent in everything that I do or maybe allowing that to happen is like important um for me to retain in some way you know like I don't want to I have that problem that I'm like, oh, I want to get in there, maybe get the legibility more clear, do something more specific. And then I'm like, okay, you got to stop. You got to, you got to disrupt that, that kind of tendency. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm not a realist. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm not a realist, but I do have a tendency to overly design. I think like I'm trying to like somehow. Yeah. And it's like, how do I harness my own, um, uh, I don't know conventions or you know things that I keep doing yeah. yeah and it's really nice to honor that funkiness that you get in the beginning when you're just tinkering and stuff mm -hmm. and I yeah, think that's also part of the sensation that you were talking about earlier like that also adds to the feeling that an audience gets or that you get pers personally um, mm -hmm. when you're making these paintings do you think about the audience at all and what yeah you know, the form of like sensation, I guess, like, and what that could affect. I, I think about the audience all the time. <laughs> I feel like it is important. Like it's important for me to communicate these things I'm feeling, but like, how do I, you know, convey that? And how do I bring them into like my world? Like I, these aren't uh, illusionistic, realist spaces they're like these weird imagined realms where like I'm thinking that maybe I can transmit somehow a feeling or a sensation that through this sort of unreality or whatever they get closer to 
maybe my my feelings about being in this kind of realm and I think about like how do I make I mean these are just questions that I ask myself in the studio like how do I make someone feel like they're in the space they're like engulfed in it they're engulfed in it but at the same time maybe through these strategies of reinforcing the surface because there's no illusionistic depth in any of these it brings them back out to then you know simultaneously recognize the the artifice of it you know like it's not actually a space they can walk in though I don't know if they'd be able to walk into a giant blue tree painting anyway but you know um that's the idea that they could feel that like that pull that immersion but then simultaneously be like no I'm not like actually in this realm right it's not like it's closed off to me to a degree um and I think about that all the time because I'm like trying to both come to terms with like how I'm making the painting or how do I figure it's resolved and then how do I think it'll like be in a space with other people so it's many it's too many things I think as a, you know too many stuff to like kind of reconcile with maybe you know but you're all painters so you, you I think you get what I'm saying <laughs> yeah totally I've you said something a while back um about this painting Zenith, I think, uh, collapsing a time frame, mm -hmm. um, which I really love. Um, and I'm looking at it, uh, unfortunately, just an image of it. Uh, but I mean, uh, I can walk up to it and do like my own thing. I have like a webcam to it. We could we could get close. <laughs> if you yeah, if you want, it's um, uh, yeah. It's yeah, let me take a little walk. <laughs> then you get a sense of the space. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's got Let's this see. like this ground like um accumulation of leaves that is I mean, I see that as a time frame. And it's combining uh both some like fisheye perspective um with some oh. traditional like landscape space. Um that's the yeah. Let's see it. Sorry, it's a little weird, like me walking around like this. But uh, we can see. put an we can put an image up too at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. This this bench, the fisheye, the incorporation of the fisheye and the echo with the rainbow, um, is really interesting. I'm wondering. There you go. Wow. That is. And the light. So the light and the perspective are kind of like interlocking in in this interesting way oh thank you yeah um i'm sorry it's a little wonky let's see if i can get it to be less there's also an ungroundedness to it like that makes me think of the digital space because the mm. ground fully yeah that's so great thanks for like so happy for you both say that <laughs> Um, on top of the photogrammetry, you know, Google discontinued um, the photosphere thing. Do you both remember that? No. Uh, so it's like, it creates like an in the round uh, oh. like space that you could like rotate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then uh, I unfolded it basically. So I like the idea of like, when you think of maps or some kind of like, cause I see this as just a mapping strategy. It's just a bunch of photos that, you know, come together to like map out a space, like a spherical form. And then you're unfolding that. I just thought it's interesting that we do a lot of mapping anyway in this kind of um, sphere form anyhow. And then that unfolding that distortion I thought was really interesting. And, and also you, that fisheye lens that you're talking about kind of, echoes the digital in a way um yeah I, I don't know I think a lot about like how when I talk about immersion or experience that I don't really feel like I'm uh totally like in tune with the landscape and I wonder if other people are feeling that like are we really present in these spaces are really participating in like this idea of like regrowth or what have you new potential futures and all that so I think um 
we kind of model or make these spaces right in the digital world now like with the modeling software and like all this mediated forms to create like a new world, a world building apart from that doesn't have the potentials, I think that disorder has. Like entropy is like a positive thing in my mind. <laughs> like yeah. it brings forth new pathways. Um, and so maybe that, those are some of the thoughts I was having uh, when I would put this one together. Um, that you kind of feel like you don't really understand your position. You're sort of in the round in a way. Um, and I got into rainbows, obviously. Yeah. I had, like, I had a rainbow moment. I, I did a little lecture for the students on the, uh, the potential avenues for rainbows. Um, I really got into it. Like, I was like, wow, I didn't realize rainbows were used so much, like, in a particular period. But then I also didn't realize that rainbows could have, like, really bad negative connotations, too, that they were, like... Um, appropriate reappropriated for like some pretty nasty stuff and I was like whoa who oh. knew that that could happen with rainbows <laughs> but I think a, oh, oh what was that it's a signature of American landscape painting too the misty rainbow that's kind it of is. about it I mean that's what I'm kind of going for but yeah. I think that there's like these undertones a little bit like if you think of Albert Bergstab you know his like paintings mm -hmm. of Yosemite are really yeah all about um you know promoting the manifest destiny yeah. as a tool of organization like these untouched yeah. spaces nobody's here so like come and like claim them you yeah. know it was actually um the weimar school i think it's called like parallel the bauhaus um yeah they used rainbows a lot in their like landscape paintings of uh, german landscapes too yeah. I thought that was pretty weird and messed up. <laughs> but like, how do you reclaim the tool of the rainbow to really be, uh, I think, positive, not this kind of terrible thing that has happened in landscape painting, right? Yeah. In a way, it's like weird. It's like taking this tool that you don't think much about, like you wouldn't think a rainbow could signify that, but it sort of does in a lot of weird ways. Yeah. Um. And then, but the way that you're approaching the colors and those neutrals is such like mm -hmm. a also a understanding of color that's so sensitive to the earth and so sensitive to material and paint, which is like literally dirt, you know? Yeah. Um, well, dirt and other, you know, chemicals and oils. And minerals. minerals. Let's call them minerals. <laughs> minerals. Um, it made my, my point sound really good to call it dirt, so. Um, but yeah, so there's this balance, I think, between the color ephemeral light, um, which is a double-edged sword um, mm -hmm. of, you know, promise and illusion, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then this, yeah. like, I'm, I'm just, I'm really drawn to the bottom uh, strip in this painting, that, like, the, mm -hmm. the leaves down there. Um, I could try to get us closer if you want to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, it's just a kind of pan maybe around it. Um, yeah, sure. See. There really is a sense of magic in this piece, like yeah. the way that the leaves are blowing and um, the glorification of the mundane. Mm -hmm. Also, like showing some kind of hopefulness to the chaos, like. So maybe if we get closer, you can see just like some detail. Yeah, and where paint just gets to be paint. That's, well, yeah, that's one of your specialties. I love paint just being paint. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's a real painting. Ooh. Yeah, and I, th I think there's something about the way that, yeah, there's a source, but there's a... Um, like almost a DNA to these forms that's um, unfolding and mutating as you work. Uh, Definitely. I'm like yeah. responding that to that for sure. I, I I think it's important to, in a lot of ways, let the painting kind of communicate what it means to you, you know, yeah. like you move forward with it and stuff. 
What do you think I'm... about time, these time oh, yeah. frames in this one? I'm curious. Oh, you mean the sort of collapsing that's happening? Yeah, for my what's the time frame? Yeah, and how are they collapsing? So like you see the, the red, the idea is that that's like the aftermath, like of a burn. And this is like the regrowth, the new stages, right? So it's it's not like an apparent collapse. It's just like, okay, there is a residue and that residue is still there. Yeah. And then there's this new space of like regrowth in this, uh, I don't know, clump of trees that was once burned, right? Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say like, in terms of like a uh, time of day or season right now. It's like a particular moment. So this is the. This isn't the last painting I made, but it was sort of like the last painting that I was thinking, like, okay, this is time for a new direction. Like this is like the marker of an end, mm -hmm. to this whole series of work. If that makes sense. Yeah, it seems like a good finale. Here, I'll uh, while we're talking, yeah. maybe I'll just kind of do okay, this. So just... Pan around a bit. Um, and yeah, life and death seems like, uh, or life cycles seem important to this body of work. I mean, I I would say yeah, totally. Like, um, everything's about cycles, basically. Mm -hmm always thought about my work in a cyclical way too like I recycle through ideas and come back to them so I don't really feel like any of this stuff is exactly linear mm -hmm. um I was talking Marie came up and saw my show oh cool <laughs> and she saw this painting and we were talking about this painting and um she was like where's the yellow coming from and I'm like and it took me a minute to realize I'm like oh it's because I was you know, driving after these giant floods, right? And I would see the sun reflecting off of like these large pools of water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes I think I make work and I don't always, uh, here, I'll come back onto the screen because maybe you're lonely. So. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes it's like once I make it, uh, then I can really see it for what it is like maybe in that moment I knew it was done and I had like this idea of an event like for that one in particular and I'll point to it I can just do this oh wait no sorry we're gonna I'm gonna swig back over really quick to the that one um when I was making, I was thinking of it like I called this one susceptible failure. Uh, so it's like the levees breaking in effect, and this water is like flowing out of this encased. It's hard to see, obviously, from an angle, but it was kind of like this uh, tree trunk that like bursts forth when the water is like flooding, going through it. And then I was thinking, oh, wow, like there's this light, the light that I saw which is really quite fabulous um, when I was driving on like the highway. Yeah. You had, there were pinks and like really intense yellows. Like the sky here is, there's a lot of color. Um, yeah. I feel like a lot of that is coming through the, through the work. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking about that one in, yeah. in particular. There's also a lot of blue. There's a lot, a lot of blue. Um, oh my gosh. So I don't know. Do we have time? Can I tell you about the blue, blueness? Yeah. Talk <laughs> about blue. So I like, you know, I was reading uh, Rebecca Solnit. Uh, I think it was like in Wanderlust. I started reading more of her books recently. And like, there's this one whole, there's this whole passage, but I love this part. Uh, um, I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you because I yeah. love reading it. I was you know, I just like to read it kind of loud. Um, the world is blue at its edges and in its depths, 
The blue is the light that got lost. The light of the blue at the end of the spectrum does not travel the whole distance from the sun to us. It disperses among the molecules of the air. It scatters in water. Water is colorless, shallow water appears to be the color of whatever lies underneath it, but deep water is full of the scattered light. The purer the water, the deeper the blue. This light that does not touch us, does not travel the whole distance, the light that gets lost, gives us the beauty of the world, so much of which is the color blue. The color of that distance is the color of an emotion, the color of solitude, of desire, the color of their seen from here, the color of where you are not, and the color of where you never go. For blue is not in the place that's miles away from the horizon, but in the atmospheric distance between you and the mountains. Wow. So wow. I was making all these paintings and I had read this, and I think it was um Calypsadra, uh that basically, you know, the it's kind of like instead of a sand. Oh my gosh, I like totally forgot the word. This is crazy. Uh, you know how they tell sand, it like falls, an hourglass. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. Instead of a sand hourglass, it's like a water hour, hourglass, basically. Um, and I made that painting and then it hit me. I'm like, there's a lot of blue in these paintings right now. Like in the studio, I'm surrounded. It like dawned on me. I mean, I don't know. It's really weird until I like saw like all of them kind of manifesting. And I was like, there's a lot of blue in this show and then, I mean, <laughs> in this group of work. And then it hit me that like, oh, that's from Solnit. Like that's from reading that passage and being like deeply affected by that. Um, and I think it's like super pivotal for everything yeah. in this show. Like that blue is such a charged like color, like emotionally, you know, um, that that like in between space between you and the mountains that like atmospheric perspective is all blue and that like exemplifies the distance between things I'm like damn that's uh really what I felt like a lot of this is kind of grappling with like you know being immersed in but separate from so yeah I felt like blue is my color right now but I don't think uh the next show is gonna be this intensely blue <laughs> I feel like I'm blued out and maybe this is yeah. something I do too like I, I feel like I go through the spectrum of the color wheel it's kind of strange I'm starting <laughs> to like realize this like okay I'm like I'm blue right now yeah. I'm not gonna be blue, but Your blue period it it really is it's my blue period another really um riveting painting in this series on the subject of blue is this one uh deluge um, oh yeah which the other one, the first uh, Zenith that we were talking about was so warm, mm -hmm. magical. This is like mm -hmm. ter terrifying magic, like uh, Mordor from afar or something. <laughs> um, do you want yeah. to talk a little bit? Yeah. Um, should I like pan to it like really quick? I mean, you can kind of see it, I think, in the... Um... We can put up the images yeah. too. Yeah. We could do that too, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Deluge, I that was like a big, big tree on my walk that had like fallen. And so the parks service was like cutting it down and breaking it up. And like this all the root system was like facing me. Like I was walking by and I was like, this was like such an immense tree and left such a gaping hole in the earth. And I really wanted to like highlight it. Um, I mean, all, all of the work is informed by this like event, but like it was that tree that I kept walking by that was like so um, left an impression on me. You know, I felt like wow, disturbed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, the way I was set it up was kind of like it is emblematic of the title <laughs> in a lot of ways. Like the that painting. Uh, you know, deluge is like this force, this thing that like has like pushed out all this water in this area that's not really stopping. But it also informed, I think, you know, the title because I see, you know, Hollow Vale is not, it's kind of like dark. I mean, it's like, hum it's like a dark humor because, you know, um, I was thinking a lot about like how my paintings are purposely lacking pictorial depth 
to also allude to the fact that like I don't feel like a, I don't feel like myself or maybe a lot of folks right now who are in denial about climate change or like these things that are happening, they, their depth, they're not really immersed in, in the environment they're in, right? Because they're not able to engage with this thing that's happening rather like, let's clean it up and figure it out, like make it look like this thing never happened and not accept that. And like, in a way I wanted to like immortalize all of those feelings I was having. I mean, I believe in climate change and I hope we can, you know, have positive change for the future and, and do all the necessary moves that it needs to take. But I feel like I'm just being bombarded by this um, lack of like resonance, you know, in the space and just bringing us to like that attention, like call attention to the fact that we're ignoring what's around us in a way like the way we kind of see the world is mediated you know like I mean I don't know if I, the painting itself is doing all the things I'm talking about but I'm definitely informed by those feelings like I, I feel like you know you're driving somewhere everything is through the mediated lens and it informs how you see the world you know and maybe in this way I could like highlight the fact that we're sort of in this like liminal space of denial <laughs> how do we move forward um and yeah, yeah maybe that's what yeah. I wanted to encapsulate you know like unfortunately you can't see it in person but like the trunk itself is like super gnarly there's like, tons of paint you know and then all of these different kind of veils and screens are like superficial right and then this thing is like in your face so that's yeah. sort of the stuff I was thinking about um and it's got yeah. that um the harsh cut of that uh, that rectangular edge just so singular yeah yeah I mean I I think I I can't get rid of it it's like it's reinforcing the fact that it's like inside the rectangle but it's like okay these are screens you know screens and screens I yeah I think it speaks to the point oh go ahead it speaks to the point <laughs> there totally oh um, yeah yeah I don't know I I uh, I don't know if um, you might have seen my last show or the, the work from the last show, but I, I got really into like screens on screens on screens, like yeah. this idea of like yeah. developing like vignettes that are like, comp you know, compressed, like instead of going, I don't know, I've been playing with this idea that like, or thinking about it a lot that, you know, in a painting, like maybe in the Hudson River School or the tonalist landscape painters, right, there's like this deep space or space that expands uh, laterally like this outside the confines of the canvas you know but what would a painting look like if it had like a shallow space that was coming out towards you this way could I, could I make that happen um, and not just feel like it sits on the surface but like in a way is bombarding you yeah oh yeah I see that yeah yeah, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like I, I don't know. I kind of come up with these like, uh, I don't know if I'd call it like games, but like definitely there's things about painting that I kind of get, I feel like I get sucked into and I just want to like figure them out to myself, you know? Um, like yeah. a puzzle. What was that? It's like a puzzle. It is like a puzzle. Yeah, it's like a puzzle. Like how does any of this work together? <laughs> Yeah, you know. Can you speak a little bit about the size shifts between the paint oh, scale? Yeah. Yes, I've been thinking a lot about scale. Like, um, it's been it's been strange because like I wanted the larger pieces to feel like encapsulating, but I've been thinking I'm kind of at this point in my work, especially in this show, because like. I don't know, my last body of work, I didn't want to show any kind of preparatory things or studies or anything small. Everything was like large in scale. And then I've been thinking a lot about maybe I, I take a step back and like focus on the intimate, like that scale shift and your relationship with it, with your body is important. Like, and I shouldn't deny that aspect, like, because these big paintings are kind of to my scale like my body like I feel like you could I mean they're not actually to scale but like you feel like you could walk into them 
sort of while well, like the smaller paintings are like zoomed in or in a way or like positioned in a way that there's like a little model or something that you're looking at you're, you're close to something um and I wonder like what is our relationship to the the microcosm the smaller components that could live in this larger landscape spaces and also the permission to play a little bit more because I've been um like just trying to figure out how to change up like the moves I make in a painting like how am I attacking the painting you know or what kind of material or gestures that I'm using and, and I discovered that um when I work smaller, I'm actually able to like work through a lot more of these ideas. And then I see that then they come back into the larger work. So I think the larger work is like where I manifest these small components, like these small ideas into a big encapsulating work. And then the small ones are like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna call them studies because they're more resolved than a study, but they're definitely like a totally different like way of thinking about what they are even you know yeah I like that thinking about um like microcosmic cosmic life forms of life um, yeah like you get really zoomed in and close up and you're like oh what are you like observing here and like how could that be brought into the larger work you know um and I got into sand I feel like I need to do more things with sand. I just haven't <laughs> yet, but like there's so many possibilities with like how you articulate a gesture or even with a color or how that when you, I mean, at the most base level, like I made one painting in here. Molly, you saw it actually. I, I remember, yeah. I remember imprint, right? Imprint, yeah. I was yeah. like, what would happen if I put something with sand and made it feel like there was like a, a shadow shape that was also an imprint on it, you know, like what would yeah. occur? How would it feel like what would the material heft feel like? Yeah. I like it. I except I remember you know, really liking it for sure. Oh, thank you. Um but yeah, uh I haven't done more sand though. Like I don't know. It was just like I'm still working through some of these things. Um these different moves, you know? Yeah. Seems like there's something there with the um, hourglass, sand as time, sand. Oh, as gosh. Time. There you go, Molly. <laughs> You're putting it all home. together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what, um, what comes next, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, me too. It's always a mystery, you know, <laughs> like, I like honestly believe that like, I mean, this is going to sound super cheesy, but that paintings have like an animistic energy. Like they're, I don't know this, I'm getting into this idea. It's not, I yeah. didn't always have an idea, everybody like where I haven't always been this way really, but like I've been thinking, oh, if I'm, if my gesture is being immortalized, like these moves that I make in time or whatever, you know, and then they culminate together. It's like, that has like an energy like that actually is holding like bodily energy yeah oh, <laughs> and yeah. then someone will come up to it and like actually experience that that energy and then there's like this weird mystery that happens because obviously other people aren't me so there's always going to be like this mistranslation and in that realm that's where like I don't know maybe that's even more interesting like, that's the third thing that's the consciousness is the space between the artist and the viewer. So there you go. The See? misinterpretations between the artist and the viewer are the consciousness. Misinterpretations. I think that's what? cool. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that? Yeah. You know? Cool. Do you have, and do you have another show coming up this year? as well or do you have more I, do. I have a, I do I do um I have a solo show in Santa Fe in June like late June um and it's called uh into the thicket <laughs> getting cool. really into it yeah so I'm really excited about that um I'm a little nervous I'm like oh I have another show <laughs> <laughs> Nervous to 
to show to have to make the work to show the work to no. oh oh yeah i mean i have it's it's interesting because i i have like the idea of the show it's gonna be some some works that i already have and some works that are in progress actually right okay. now um and so but at the same time like i like did not i don't feel like i have spatial good spatial reasoning and this is like weird like i don't think i can i can't imagine it you know, like make like a little model. I've been making like a sketch model of the show and like putting yeah. things on there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, it looks great. But I did the same thing for this show. And I'm like, and I and I took out two paintings because then I realized like, oh, it looks a little crowded in here. You know, oh, like I don't, yeah. I need to be like in it to really yeah. understand. So that's what makes me nervous. It's like, did I really do the math right? Am I like figuring out like how things are gonna look next to each other? Mm -hmm. I don't actually know until I'm there if it works or not, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess you all know that like I'm a maximalist, like the paintings are like really, there's no breathing room. I, I think there's more of a breathing room now than mm -hmm. before, um, but I've been trying not to do that in the show space so like I omitted two paintings from this show just because I was like maybe I shouldn't you know maximize like every square inch of the wall like maybe breathing is important mm -hmm. like I don't know I've been trying to like accept that idea more yeah. which I think is good <laughs> yeah there is a lot of like visual breath in the work Thank you. Yeah. Although I know that your material application can get it can get like a little messy. I don't know. <laughs> messy. Is, I think messy is good. Like I don't know about either of you, but um, I don't know. Like I, I'm really bad. Like I'm really bad. There's like paint all over like my tubes of paint and everywhere, and I've been trying oh, yeah. to like. I have been like really cleaning my palette. I'm like, oh, this is like really good. Like I clean my palette. I feel organized. Like I'm trying to like organize my studio space. So like if the paintings are really intense and the floor gets kind of messy, like at least my palette looks good, you know? <laughs> that's kind of <laughs> my thoughts, you know? Yeah, that's your, your palette is your like working memory, right? You need to keep that. You need to keep it fresh. Not <laughs> Yeah. Where can they find you, Mirabel? Oh, um, yeah, you can like find me on Instagram at my handle, which is at Mirabel Wigan. Um, and my website, same name. So you can check out things there. Sign up for my mailing list. I'm trying to get better at MailChimp. So you cool. should be, you know, hearing updates periodically, hopefully at least three times a year <laughs> that's right i'm trying to do like mass you, you know like a yeah. bunch of things in one uh, newsletter but yeah i would love for more folks to sign up for that that'd be awesome do i am i already in or do i have to opt in i want to be on it oh wait you're not on it you're both not on my mailing list <laughs> i'll 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 sign up okay cool i'm not sure who's on it i think i i don't know i know yeah. it goes out to people I'm not sure who. Yeah. But yeah. I'll find out. And uh, hopefully all our viewers will too. Awesome. <laughs> Thank well, you. So I mean, much. Well, this has been an incredible experience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad we got to see the work in the space and have this conversation. Yeah. No, thank you. I'm a pleasure talking about it. It was awesome. Cool.